I was going to go with Huck teaches me how to be a mansman. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Kyle. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. And as you will have noticed, although those of you who are watching can see him, this is Kyle. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and Kyle is our guest for this week. Uh, Kyle used to be my roommate, actually. You can see him in videos on my old channel. Yep. Recently reactivated. Um, way, way back. But he has never actually been on the podcast. No. Though you did have to put up with season one, I believe, of the podcast. And then you went to Sweden. Yes. To escape the podcast. <laughs> but we are here. And we are here to talk about self-directed learning. Uh, we all have master's degrees. I have a master's in philosophy. Ryan, you also have a master's in philosophy. I do. Huck, or Kyle, rather. I know who yeah. you are. I <laughs> double promise that yeah. I'm I'm really used to this person yeah. on my left being Ryan. I'm sorry. Especially because yeah. you called me Ryan and then you switched to Huck, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of Ryans. That is true. That is true, yes. Uh, but Kyle, you, you have a master's from Sweden. Yeah, in, Malmö. Yeah. Uh, in international migration and ethnic relations. Yeah. Um, you know, like a real degree, as opposed to us. <laughs> <laughs> but no, what we wanted to talk about today was self-directed learning. So after you've graduated from, from university... Where do you go in, in your education and learning, and why do you do it, and why bother, and how do you find it? And, icebreaker. Given that we have all pursued self-directed learning in one way or another, uh, you know, just sort of doing it on your own and gotten it out, what is the thing that paid off? Kyle, you're the guest, so you get to go first. Sure. Uh, for me, self-directed learning uh, was somewhat of an integral part of my learning. I did two bachelor, two bachelor degrees uh, at once, as well as two minor degrees. So I had to do some online learning, some distance education learning. Uh, for example, in the summer, you know, I'd go home, um, but I would still take courses. Uh, and mm -hmm. in that sense, I was able to complete both of uh, both of the degrees and the minor degrees as well in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, because you did your so, undergrad in like six years? Six years, yeah. To put that in perspective, I only got one degree with a minor, and it took me five. And for like a year of that, I was going part-time. Like... Two degrees in six years is impressive. <laughs> there, are, there were a lot of terms with like six courses. Yeah, and that takes some serious <laughs> get shit done. Uh, Huck. Uh, when I worked in the gambling lab, um, we needed some special equipment. Um, one of the studies that we did required us to measure the force at which a person would push the button to spin the reels. And we could have probably spent a lot of money to get that custom made for us or we could make it ourselves so we got a force sensor that um, was modded from a uh, USB mouse and so we, basically what we needed to do was mod um, the mouse so that it would register the click it would have the force sensor in it and it would split uh, one USB into the computer so that it would actually control the, the clicking and the other one would go into the uh, biometric data capturing equipment and it had to all then export over to a, th a second laptop that was actually the, the laptop that was recording the data as it was going and somebody had wired the first one but we had two more that we needed wiring and which involved soldering. So we had the raw components made, but we needed to solder all the wires together. And it involved, a, at one point, a weird, like, three-way, awkward bit of connecting of the wires. So I took somebody's really bad, like, MS Paint drawing of the schematic, <laughs> and I watched a series of YouTube videos on how to solder, because I've never soldered before, 
And I took my boss's credit card and I went down to Radio Shack and bought like a hobby soldering kit, um, a desk, um, a magnifying glass with clamps so that I could clamp the wires together. Uh, 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 one of those hair dryer heat shrinking, yeah, the heat, uh, guns. The heat guns. I mean, it was essentially a hair dryer, but just concentrated in a bunch of the, the tube wraps and some some uh, uh, box cutters. Uh, and then, yeah, I just sat at my desk and learned how to, wa- oh, and I, the, the soldering wire too. And I learned how to wire the, these, these pieces. And of course I was doing it wrong. Like I was hovering right over top as I was soldering. Yeah, so all of, the, all of the, all the fumes were just like in it's my bad face. Yeah. I know it was really bad for me. It probably, I don't know, maybe it explains a lot. We'll get Dan, <laughs> we'll get Dan, uh, Dan from, from our, our lit podcast earlier in this season. He, he was a professional solderer for years. We'll get him back on the on the podcast to school you and how to solder. I would I would be more than happy to learn. Uh, those skills eventually then translated into when we were out in the field, um, we would do uh, experiments where we'd capture skin sweat, which would uh, be a proxy measurement for uh, excitement levels. Um, and there was it was basically just two metal plates that you would attach to your fingers, and then the wires would run to the apparatus, but. Because they were really thin wires on people's hands, and then people's hands were resting on the table, and like they'd move their fingers and stuff. Eventually, the wires would um, weaken, and then the sensors would come off. Mm-hmm. So I was the only person on the casino trip, and we're in a casino uh, who knew how to do basic soldering. And so I would I would wow. take the spare equipment and I'd solder it off to the side in the casino. <laughs> And and repair the equipment on the fly so that we didn't lose any time with uh, with any of our experiments or our, our, our um, participants. Um, so yeah, that paid off. That little just bit of uh, it was a yeah self directed learning. Like I got a little bit of guidance from YouTube um, and then googling articles and stuff like that. But otherwise, nobody was there to show me how to do it. And uh, yeah, so that's that's my experience of it paying off pretty big. Nice. Mine, I guess, is, uh, I want to say the most boring. It's not nearly as interesting as either of those. Uh, I started making websites when I was, like, 16, 17. I made a bunch of joke websites. I made a bunch of, like, just random, random stupid things, most of which don't exist anymore. Um, and I started, just experimented with HTML, and then CSS became a thing, and I learned CSS. Uh, now I'm learning JavaScript, because I'm catching up with the times. But it wound up being related to almost all of my side projects and not at all to my degrees ever, like to my actual primary education, but hugely to my career because it turns out that um, a dude with a bit of like problem solving skills and, and... like elementary philosophy lingo who also knows web stuff is a person that people want to have around which is still weird to me but (laughs) now it is essentially what i do i troubleshoot web issues uh for a company and you know write stuff it's a thing, and it turned into. It, it is weird to me that it turned into my career, but I think that it's not actually that weird. Like the, the standard, kid plays with computers for a while until it eventually becomes their job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that, perhaps somewhere in there, usually that kid goes and gets an education in like computer science or programming or whatever instead of you know, attempting to figure out having how to navigate the world through the lens of a philosophy program. But here we are. I'd like to push back on one thing you said there, because there is a stronger connection between philosophy and programming. That's that, true. That I that I discovered, uh, again, in the gambling lab, um, my experiences in formal logic greatly helped me. Even mm-hmm. though I can't code, I don't have the, the grammar to be able to code and whatnot, but I can look at code and I can read it and I can figure out enough of what it's saying to make heads or tails of it, mm-hmm. which... Again, another area where it paid off huge to have this background. And this ties in with something we talked about in the pre-show of, like, I like to gather knowledge and then eventually, like, it'll come out in in weird ways at unexpected times. Mm -hmm. We ran a study 
uh, where we were uh, manipulating a person's ability to recall the amount of times a jackpot was going to win. And we did that by triggering um, audio cues for the jackpot. So we'd have, uh, if a jackpot would line up on the center line, um, and then it would have an audio cue of as they lined up, sounds would trigger. So it'd be like a ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk when they were spinning and stopping. But the problem was, is we, one of the laptops had an earlier version of that uh, program that was calling for the sound files inappropriately. Like it was either calling them in the wrong directory (laughs) or it had the wrong name for it. So it wasn't like the whole rest of the program was running, but it wasn't calling the audio files. It was silent. Right. And so we had ran an entire day before one of us and I think it was me I'm like I'm listening to the headphones and I'm like wait a second that there's a sound that's missing out of this this jumble of lights and sounds that's going on and I realized what was going on which you'd think okay if I know what computer it is it's fine but we'd already been uploading the data and it's all anonymized participants mm-hmm. so we had to figure out which studies to exclude or scrap the entire day worth of people which was you know like 20 or 30 participants and the way I did that was in the lab, I called up the, the XML files that, talk, that showed the entire uh, skeleton of the program. And I went through it like line by line by line in all these files until eventually I found the right file, the right set of, of um, the, the right nested um, argument. Because that, that's the way I looked at it. I looked at it mm-hmm. as nested arguments where it was calling for sounds in one but in the other one it had an extra command line that was what it was supposed to be in the original and i was able to say okay any programs that use this which associates with these participants we can scrap these no problem and save everything else so i ended Mm -hmm. up saving an entire day's worth of data all because i was a philosophy student and i knew how to read arguments yeah so so like for me like html and css don't do stuff they just make, <laughs> they just they just make stuff and make stuff look like stuff. Yeah. So logic doesn't come into it as much. But I see where I, I definitely see where you're going. So you um, sell yourself short. I do often. <laughs> uh, so post grad learning, uh, Kyle, you've been doing a bunch. You just finished a program with Amnesty International. Yeah, um, I use edX. Um, uh, and oh, have, have we mentioned what a MOOC is first? Of all? No, but edX is a MOOC. Yeah. So um, so a MOOC is a, ma- a massive open online course. Um, and there are several of them. There are, for example, edX, uh, Coursera, mm-hmm. uh, Udemy, I think, runs it. Yep, Udemy. Um, MIT and Harvard run their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harvard is, well, I know that Harvard has courses on edX, mm-hmm. okay. um, but so they very I'm, well I'm, could run their own. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. I, I'm pretty uh, sure MIT runs their own. We'll have links for all these in the show notes as well. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so um, I uh, use edX, and one of the courses on edX was uh, run by Amnesty International because a lot of universities internationally will have these courses on edX or Coursera. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ed- uh, Amnesty International was running a course on uh, the right to uh, freedom of expression. Um, and because, like, a lot of my knowledge comes from my master's degree in international migration and ethnic relations, um, freedom of expression really ties into that so for me it was a really good way to supplement my the learning that i had done and increase it and also broaden my knowledge Mm -hmm. nice so how was it you you finished it you got i finished it um and the way that uh, edX works is uh, you can do it for free um and you can get a certificate um uh, that says that you finished it, um, but you can also do the um, a, a paid version. And if you do the paid version, you get like a, a signature from the the people who've run the course and also from the uh, institution. Um, and so you can also load these on like your LinkedIn profile, for example, mm. uh, as like an actual proof that yes, he's done it, and yes, he's verified his identity that he is the person he says he is on the course. Um, so I completed it and I, I did the paid version because it was really related to my studies. Um, so now it's something that I can use, uh, in job applications, um, or volunteering. Yeah. I, that's a huge boon of MOOCs too, is that, um, they help sort of build your CV. Absolutely. Yes. In a, in a, in a, in a way that people who don't know you immediately understand. Um, like as a, as a, like when when someone's looking at your LinkedIn profile or something, 
they can't see all of your soft skills. They right. can see your claim to have soft skills. Mm-hmm. But what they can when when they can see these hard certifications, um, and there's there's a lot of debate about the quality and value of MOOCs. Like, yes. I, I used to work um, at the University of Waterloo, and it's a huge thing in fact in faculty negotiations right now, and it has been for longer than anyone would care to admit. But reg- at the end of the day, if you have a whole bunch of of certs like that, it seems like like here is a person who works well independently, gets stuff done on their own, you know, and that is the kind of self-starter that, that one would like to employ. So even regardless of what one might think about course quality, it still shows a person who has gone on learning. Yeah, and I think uh, another uh, benefit, too, is, um, you know, there are some institutions, for example, Harvard, that are really... Mm-hmm. Uh, they're highly praised Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is uh, like a MOOC uh, that Harvard has online you know people can take these courses and be like hey you know I've I've invested in uh, a course offered by Harvard so it's like it's an institution that's well known and it's a good institution um, and you can get that uh, sort of knowledge base knowing that it is the the institution it is yeah and it Um, it is not my uncle Benny, right? Precisely. It yeah. is an yeah. accredited professor. Yes, at exactly, Harvard. exactly. Yeah, an accredited professor um, who runs it as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, it was a, a really funny MOOC story that I always think of. There was a a prof who did a MOOC on I want to say Aristotle, and it wound up being broadcast on South Korean television. And they got invited to South Korea to throw the opening pitch at a baseball game because it was a huge thing. <laughs> and they were, like, secretly famous in South Korea. Wow. I'll dig up the article and put it in the show That's notes. Cool, yeah. It was amazing. And it was like, because the other thing that it does in teaching MOOCs is it just, it extends your reach far oh, beyond yeah. what you could know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and it was um, that was another thing too. The sort of international aspect is, um, uh, I was you know, conversing with people from all over the world about, mm-hmm. um, in my case, like the the right to freedom of expression and people's own experiences with it in different parts of the world. And that's a way to do it with uh, that, that, like broadens your your knowledge and I want to say your expertise. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of online learning resources for stuff like skills. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you've, been, you've both been messing around with... I'm uh, messing around with the wrong term, but you've both been um, taking studies at uh, Duolingo, right? Yes, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. yeah. you were yeah. taking... Oh, um, I, I've taken a lot of stuff. I Like, I was doing Swedish. Um, I, I, I did French. I haven't done that in a while, unfortunately. Um, but right now I'm doing German and Portuguese as well. So. You're a cheater. One of your minors is in language studies. I studied yeah. languages with yes. Kyle in university. Yeah. And let me tell you, Kyle's a cheater. <laughs> um, Kyle's not actually a cheater. No. <laughs> no. You, 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 were, you were that person in the class who, like, is good at it and also works at it. <laughs> and is the guy who's just kind of good at it. I'm like, oh. But and you yeah. were you were studying German? Yes, I, yeah. I'm still working on German. I yeah. try to do at least one lesson a day, or if not one lesson, then one uh, drill a day mm-hmm. because it'll it has the option to allow you to just it's a barbell it allows you to kind of exercise yeah. what, uh, whatever yeah. level you're weak at. So um, so yeah, I try to do at least one, and I, that's um, Duolingo is being built upon the one distance ed course I did. In German at UW, uh, at UW for your arts degree, you're, you're required to take. Well, it can be two language courses. It can also be cashed out with cultural courses, like yeah, the, the German ancient, German thought and culture, for example. Yeah, or yeah. A, the ancient Greeks and Romans, like the second year course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I took French in class and then didn't enjoy the in class portion, so I tried the German uh, distance ed course, and I liked learning German, uh, but the the distance ed was kind of an interesting beast that I didn't... I mean, it's one of those things where distance ed and language courses tend to get put on the back burner uh, compared to your major. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what happened to me. And so... But I did learn a little bit. And then uh, I was dating a girl whose mom was German. And so I just <laughs> thought that the, it'd be super clever of me to learn how to speak German. So... And then I just... I've stuck with it. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm I, I'm a language nerd. So when I was in when I, when I saw when everyone else was moaning about their their two language course requirement in university, I'm like only two. But I already took German, and I'm gonna do like Latin and ancient Greek and yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I was the same. I was like, yeah, so like hey, excitement. Yeah. You went much yeah. farther in both Latin and, and, and ancient Greek than I did. <laughs> Oh man! But I still translate a Latin motto like nobody's business, <laughs> <laughs> and I will occasionally translate stuff for writers on Twitter. The closest I come to translating Latin is medical texts or medical medical <laughs> words and whatnot. So, just because I find it's easier to to go that route rather than try to describe it in English. Yeah, for me, it's mostly practical stuff. Like I, I have a really hard time sitting down and learning something. I have to have a thing that I need to do with it. Like right now I'm I'm working with Code School. And uh, before that Code Academy and I'm learning JavaScript and jQuery and because these are essential web skills and they do really cool things and it's super super helpful to my work and also to my play assuming that I have a thing I want to do with it. Like right now if you want me to build you a JavaScript calculator 100% but usually what I need to do is pick the thing that's like 10 levels above where I am and go, okay, now I, here's how I learn what I need to know to get there. And then I'll learn that piece by piece. But if I pick the thing that's two levels above where I am, I just sort of get bored halfway through. Um, or I just, I just keep, like I, I'm sort of taking, completing courses for the sake of completing courses, mm-hmm. which is a feeling that is also just sort of unrewarding yeah like whereas if i have a thing that i need to do i will keep working in that thing until it until it goes Mm -hmm. that's how we got a map in the D &D community is i I sort of had to figure out the scripts and do some research online and then learn how to make a map and a big cool map in photoshop that's the thing you sent me right yeah Yeah, that was yeah that that was cool that was christmas that was how I spent my Christmas, was building this big fantasy map. I'll link it in the show notes, but I, building this big fantasy map in, in Photoshop and then figuring out how to um, find and use a script that mixed it up with Google's APIs so you can get like the Zoom, mm-hmm. like Google Maps. And it was super fun, uh, but once it's done, it's done, and I sort of try and move on to the next thing. And if I don't have a next thing, then it's really challenging for me. So, so courses like... Duolingo or, or Code School, they just teach me things that I don't have a spot for yet. Mm-hmm. Especially when you don't know what you can do with it. Yeah, that's definitely one of... Because like for me, it's like, I should learn French because Canada. But then I should learn German because I have like my family background. Uh, but then I should learn Swedish because I, was, I, I lived and I, did, I studied in Sweden for a while. So it's like I have all these issues of like, what should I focus on? Uh, and I haven't really found which one I should focus on yet. Yeah. Which is why I still have those four, as I said earlier. Um, <laughs> so why do it? I mean, I mean, why do this stuff? Like, like you, you have finished. Usually, when people get out of university, I mean, you are aching to not learn thing anymore. Like you have, you want to sort of, you know. I, I, I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of claim to the title of lifelong learner now, but I am highly skeptical of lifelong learners because it is hard to put your money where your mouth is. Well, I and and for me as well because definitely as soon as as soon as I like got out of university and got job, I was just like okay, job now, and what and. Video games? Video games are fun. But, so, I mean, there's a big question about why do it. I think uh, the big the big thing about uh, university is it's always a prescribed curriculum mm-hmm. that's coming at you that you have to do. Um, when you start self-directing your own learning, you set your own curriculum. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, there, I mean, there's the... The flip side to that, and this is something that I'm only just starting to come to terms with, is learning how to to set up that curriculum. Um, because, like, when you come out of university, you, suddenly now you can read any book you want to read, yeah, and mm-hmm. and then you can become paralyzed 
with, okay, there's so much stuff out there, I don't know where to start, and then every other priority gets in, in your way, you start work and whatnot, and then it's really easy, and then, like, it's really easy to shut yourself down after work and uh, be really lazy because work pressures and home pressures and family pressures and whatnot. So it's really easy to, to kind of fall off as self-directed, whereas when you're doing proper self-directed learning, like, you have an end goal, and then you have to set up the intermediate steps to get from here to there. It's kind of like you're pick ten, something 10 levels ahead and then mm-hmm. flesh out what those intermediate 10 level steps are going to be in order for you to reach it. Um, and I think that's that's why it's so, so important to, to be intentional when it comes to self-directed learning is you have to, you have to consciously be just, okay, I, I want to learn this and I need to learn it in these steps in order to do X or have some experience you know what I mean Mm -hmm. so but for me it's just um, I guess a a curiosity thing Um, or perhaps like uh, if I happen upon something then I uh, like the way that I work is like I I will happen upon something and I'll want to learn more and more and more Uh, and that's kind of how Sweden happened actually like I was Mm -hmm. just like one day I was on Wikipedia and I was reading about Sweden and that got me interested in the language so I bought the language book and then I got more interested after learning some of the language and then you know I ended up studying there yeah Uh, because you were in Sweden for like two years well one full year but I I've I've gone there more than once Yeah. yeah um so for me, it's just like, it, I guess it's a curiosity thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm, my problem is, to, like, I have a lot of interest in then, like, rather than focusing on one language, for example, I, I, I it's like, I, I'm like, ooh, there's so many of them, so I'll learn so, like, a lot. Uh, I'll learn a lot of them at once. And so, you know, rather than being fluent in Swedish right now, for example, I, I know some, but then I know a little bit of German, too, so... And then I know a little bit of French, so that's that is my issue. Hmm. Um, that's neat. Yeah, so. I like I go mad, like legit mad. Um, like I mean, not if I'm if I, not like if I'm not learning stuff, but if I'm not doing stuff. I went through. I, I did go through a period where like. All I did was go to work, go home, and play video games. And it drives me fucking crazy. Like, I just sort of... Because i become, a, like, a super recluse. And, I mean, I'm a super recluse now, but I, I become even more reclusive. And forget that I can do stuff. And feel bad, because I'm not doing stuff. And I see people doing stuff. I'm still consuming their media. And I'm just like... But I'm playing video games. Like, and it gets to the point where, uh, like, during during Vita, I was putting out, you know, nine to ten videos a week, and running two D&D games, and working, and writing for Mad Art Lab, and, you know, finishing up a website project, and, 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 and I'm like, I'm so happy. <laughs> It's just like stuff is getting made, shit is getting done. Oh my god, this is great! And because otherwise, I just I'm I'm just sad all the time, uh, and I'm like, this is a horrible feeling. And so I just there's a minimum level of like stuff I need to be doing, even if it is just like running two D and D games, which is a, a, a middling sized creative burden. To just like come up with four hours of content every week. I'm I'm a little I'm in the same boat for a slightly different reason. Mine tends to be a existential angst that comes along with I like if I play a video game or if I binge watch on Netflix. Right now, my my biggest vice is YouTube. I'll sit down and, I, and I'll be <laughs> yeah. and I'll and I will be yeah. lost to YouTube for for hours oh, on yeah. end. I've done that. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. There's a reason why I don't go to bed at a reasonable time. Um, but Fallout. <laughs> yeah. I again, it's why I'm I, the only video game right now I play is uh, Guitar Smith. So it's it's a productive. Yeah, yeah. It's a productive. Sorry, yeah, Rocksmith. It's a productive use of my time. But for me, when I when I feel sad about 
about how I used my time. It's only because I realized that that time is now gone. I've wasted that time because nothing, I have nothing to show for that time. Mm. You know, it's, it's the passive consumption. It's sitting there watching YouTube. It's sitting there binge watching on Netflix. So that's why in uh, January through February, I didn't, I, I pay for a Netflix subscription, but I, I never used it once. Um, I have other video games, but <clears throat> I didn't play them. Uh, it's how I got through at the, at the end of February. I think it was what, nine or 10 books that I had read. Nice. Um, a split between books and audiobooks. As of recording, I'm at 15 now because I just finished an audiobook on the drive home from Newmarket yesterday. So, um, so yeah, that's <laughs> usually I turn to these self directed projects or I turn to these these bits where I expand knowledge or practice a skill or something because I feel like if I don't, then that's an opportunity to have developed as a person that I wasted. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. Um, for me, it's it's very similar. Where it's like uh, I I have a lot of like I'm not afraid of looking and looking at something and saying, hey, maybe I can try that. Um, and my education has something to do with that because like I, I study so many things because I had so many interests. And like you know, like I I have I failed a course, but for me it wasn't the end of the world. You know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try again. And that taught me that you know you can keep trying things and keep bettering yourself. Um, so like I, uh, self-directed learning for me is like, Hey, you know, maybe you can learn a little bit about this thing that can improve your skills in something or, or your, well, your, your breadth of knowledge. Um, so that's why I really like self-directed learning Neat. personally. Um, so earlier we mentioned a bunch of MOOCs as resources like edX and Coursera. Mm -hmm. Um, there are also distance ed courses through a lot of universities yes. that you can take. Um, UW, which is our alma mater has a uh, a center for extended learning mm -hmm. uh, skill sites like Duolingo and Code School mm -hmm. uh, Code School is, is it costs money it's not a lot of money but it does cost money Code Academy is free if you want to learn to code and it's got really good lessons mm -hmm. Uh, where else? Where else do you learn stuff? Language learning. Um, he, you don't learn lessons from him, but you learn strategies. It's Benny, Benny the polyglot. Uh, well, I guess he's kind of like that's his moniker. Uh, his story is he was you know an Irish guy that could barely function in his own language in traditional schooling. Always did very poorly, and he thought he didn't have um, the the kind of ur stuff to be able to do it. Then he just decided to pick up and go and live in a place for like three months. And so that's his thing is he, he's now f conversationally fluent in 10 or so languages. Wow. And his, so his method in a nutshell is when he wants to go somewhere, he'll pick up a phrase book and on the flight he will – he's got a um, – you know, list of say a hundred common words and phrases mm -hmm. that he must learn, and then as soon as the wheels are down on the in the place, he stops speaking English and he only he immerses himself in there. And his thing is, language users when when you're speaking with a native language user, they're incredibly forgiving on mistakes if you're mm -hmm. making a genuine attempt to yeah. speak their language, and they will work with you in trying to come about it. And then you just you learn out of necessity, like if you need to use the washroom and you don't know how to ask for it. Like, you know, yeah. that, that that could depend on where you go, though. If you go to Sweden uh, and if you try to speak Swedish, they will respond to you in English mm -hmm. um, because all all Swedes are very very fluent in English. Mm -hmm. um, just, just pretend you don't speak English. <laughs> I suppose so. Um, but that was actually one of the frustrating things about learning tr or trying to learn Swedish is that they'd always respond to you in English. You'd be like, "No, do it in Swedish, please." I speak um, Southern anyway. American. Oh my! <laughs> they switch right back. Um, so Benny is on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, he, he, I think he does a few YouTube things, but he has his own website. Um, okay. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah, we'll, as soon I'll, as Huck sends it to me, I'll, f I'll figure it. His name's Benny, and he's got a he's got a, a, a blog. Uh, fluent in three months, I think, cool. is what it's called. But we'll, fit, we'll find it. Um, yeah, for any, for for l basically any skill, I have found YouTube to be a boundless resource. Like, mm -hmm. I follow like five guitar instructors on YouTube, and I'm always learning new stuff, even if I'm not practicing as much as I should, which I never am. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but basically, like, if you want to learn to play a musical instrument and you do not have the money for lessons, which is not shocking, lessons are not cheap, 
you can learn from YouTube. Absolutely. You can learn... If you want to learn karate, you can probably learn it from YouTube. Mm-hmm. If you want... Like, like juggling, knitting... Knitting cro- and crocheting. That's how yeah. I learned. Yeah, because you just yeah. you just learned to knit and yes. crochet. Yeah. You, yeah. Did you crochet that bracelet? Yes. Yes. Crochet that, yeah. For those of you listening, this is the sound of Kyle's bracelet. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. Shh. They can hear it. They know. It's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you can learn to do pretty much anything from YouTube... And there, there's an opportunity on YouTube, if there isn't anything, for people to teach it. But teaching that kind of thing is a whole other podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we should wrap up, though. Tips for success. What If you could give people, someone, specifically our listeners, because they're the ones who are hearing us, one piece of advice to succeed in self-directed learning... What would it be, Kyle? Uh, just go ahead and do it. Don't be afraid uh, of investing your time in something, even if mm-hmm. you don't know much about it. Um, you know, you, you got to even if you got to fail, that, that doesn't matter. You'll still learn from that. Mm-hmm. So go, you know, go ahead, do invest some time into what you wanted, you've wanted to do for a long time. If you've found something online, uh, and don't be afraid to. Only one thing? Yeah, only one thing. Uh, okay, so I might be stealing yours. I hope mm. not. Um, mine would be pick a concrete application of something you want to do yep. that forces you... So you might have to learn a bunch of separate tangentially related skills, but and ideally it'd have to be something that you have to make or produce is the easiest way to do it. So for example, um, if you want to learn a language like go to a place even if it's just for you know a few days if it's within your within your budget but at the same time to go to a place you have to learn how to budget like you learn additional skills that Mm -hmm. way um one project that i'm going to start uh i'm just slowly compiling the pieces as i want to make a um a mirror that has a monitor mounted to the back side of it that is attached to I wanted to use a, a Raspberry Pi, but I kickstarted a separate uh, board online, and I want to try using that. Uh, but pretty much, uh, it you, it uh, is Wi-Fi enabled. It gathers like your calendar information and weather and whatnot, and then it puts it to the monitor, which goes through the. It's not a real mirror; it's like a one yeah. two-way mirrors. Um, so like, yeah, you have a mirror, and it's basically a heads-up display of your calendar and whatnot. Neat. Um, so that's that's going to be a little bit of woodworking, a little bit of electronics, um, possibly a little bit of coding, but I think I'm just going to copy and paste the project. And there are projects all over the place online that give you step-by-step tutorials on how to do it, and then you just have to work and figure it out and, and goof around with it. Yeah. So um, I know a lot of coders who, like in between jobs or, or while they're working, they'll contribute to open source projects for mm-hmm. the same reason. Like it, doing that kind of stuff sharpens your skills. Mm-hmm. It, it helps you build things and helps you, once you can build a thing, you feel like you, you remember that you can build things. Uh, you did indeed steal my piece, my piece of advice. I can give you one. Uh, no, I have one. Okay. I have more than one. It's cool. Uh, my piece of advice is whatever you do, whatever you pick, whatever, how, no matter how many things it is, do it, Every day. A little bit. Just a little bit. For me, it's my big, big hurdle right now is drawing. I really want to learn to draw. Huck's been putting up these freaking gorgeous ass drawings every day. And I can (laughs) barely draw a stick figure. And I'm like, but I really want to draw because I really want to draw this comic. And I, it's just, you just got to do it every day. Like a little tiny bit. Languages are the same way. Absolutely. You will learn way more from doing a language for 10 minutes every day than you will for an hour a week. Yeah, because, uh, like, I'll just budge in for a second. Like, I was mm-hmm. talking about how I was doing French, you know, and I haven't done it for several months now. And I'm going to have to start from square one again because, you know, well, not necessarily exactly mm-hmm. square one, but from, you know, a lot. I'll have to review a lot of the stuff that I already had learned and spent a lot of time learning because I hadn't followed up on it. I didn't continue it. Yeah. Whether it's, like, um, guitar, like I've been playing guitar for, ooh, how old am I? 33? 
30 minutes. Bah, bah, bah. No, I, damn it. Well, by the time of recording, I'm not 33. By the time of release, I am. Damn it. Um, so I've been playing guitar for 18 years. And I can still tell on my fingers and by the way the back of my hands feel when I haven't been playing for like two weeks. Like we skipped a band practice and I haven't been practicing because I've been busy doing other stuff. And I can tell. Like it, because it matters. Just do it for like 10 minutes every day and it will add up and it will become vastly more tangible even if it annoys your roommates. Uh, so if you are pursuing a self-directed learning project, help us keep you accountable uh, by posting it down below because we're curious and we like you. Probably. <laughs> um, you can learn about our self-directed learning projects uh, probably from our various blogs and Twitters, which are also down below. Or How my, do you Twitter? Once if in you, a blue moon. If you have, uh, so, that is something I also need to get on. Ooh, um, so, so Kyle, yes. Kyle, perhaps one of your self-directed learning pro- projects is... Uh, how to Twitter. How yes. to Twitter. <laughs> or, or I, I, will, I will give you my Twitter once I remember what it is. I have it on my cell phone, so I never need to log tell, in, which is the you, problem. I'll tell you what. Um, we'll put your LinkedIn <laughs> down below instead. Sure. There, you can see <laughs> Kyle's completed courses and everything that he's done that down there. And for, and, uh, for me, it's uh, Instagram. It's, yes, Instagram. For Huck, it's one. Instagram to see pictures of his dog, uh, but also your drawings in my projects. Yeah. yeah. All right. So have fun learning, and I mean, ideally, have fun. But if you don't, at least make stuff. Mm. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Kyle. We're signing off. I thought I'd give it to You had one else. job! I thought I'd give it to somebody else this time. You didn't tell me you would... <laughs> you didn't no, say... No, you didn't have one job. He <laughs> has one job! They didn't tell me anything about signing off or if I needed to do anything, so... Not my fault. Stay self-directed? Not my fault. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs>